Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Peaches are delicious. Canning them lets you enjoy them all year. Also, diseases love your flowers as much as you do. Today, we'll talk about how to control them. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Ms. Juanita Jones. Ms. Jones is one of the owners of Jones Orchard, and Joellen Diamond will be joining us later. Joellen is a TSU Extension agent in Tipton County. All right, Ms. Juanita, we have some beautiful, tasty peaches here. Yes, we do. What are do. you about to do with those? I'm about to can these peaches up for use later on when we get done with the season. Uh, the season is usually over, oh, about the 1st of September, okay. middle of September, long in there. So these can be enjoyed year round and you get your local product all year from the canning. From the canning. Yes. All right, sounds good. Okay. All right. All right, so you want to demonstrate? Yes. How we cut those peaches, <laughs> okay. those gut peaches from John's right. Orchard? Uh, the, the first thing we do, Chris, is to get our, get our jars and make sure the jars are nice and clean and sterilized. Okay. Now, I have uh, taken the liberty to go ahead and fill these and I wanted to show you what I do with the peaches and how I cut them and, and all of that. Is that okay? That is just fine. Okay. That works for me. Now these peaches have been washed and we want to start out with, of course, clean fruit. Uh, everything has to be very clean so that you don't get any spoilage or anything out of the, um, out of the ordinary in your fruit and it, it, uh, 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 that's one thing that you want to be very careful about. Okay. okay, now I've peeled this one. So uh, this jar I've done quarters, and this jar I've done halves. And I just wanted you to see the difference. And, and to, for the quarters, I just cut them like that mm -hmm. and put them in the jar. And then when I do the halves, I turn these upside down and put them down one on, on top of the other. Okay. So, and you've probably done this. I've done, I've done it a few times. Uh, times. <laughs> yeah. You're good at it. I can see that. <laughs> okay. Uh, then after after we do that, we um, put some, uh, what, this is called a simple syrup. <laughs> and the way we do the simple syrup, uh, I've done a medium syrup here. And I use four cups of water and three cups of sugar. Hmm. And I put it on the stove and let it come to a boil. Okay. You don't want to, to put it in when it's grainy or anything like that with the sugar. And, and so you fill, fill this and you want to make sure that you have the syrup over the top of your product. Uh, that way you don't get the air. Uh, the air will cause discoloration. It won't affect the nutritive value or anything. It just is the aesthetics of it. Okay. So you want to make sure that it's uh, that you're uh, it's over the top. Now why, why do we put the syrup over the peaches anyway? To give it flavor okay. and to to uh, I don't know how you could can peaches without <laughs> without putting it's just, just a plain peach in there. I don't think it would give it enough liquid to okay. to to keep it from turning dark. Right. Just in case somebody asks us. Oh okay. Okay. Well we won't answer questions. That's right. So after you get the air bubbles out, you want to make sure you get as much of the air bubbles out that you possibly can. Uh, then, then your syrup sometimes will look diminished. So if that happens, you will need to add some more to make sure that you have plenty of syrup. And one of the most important things uh -huh. that you'll ever do in canning, and this is across the board, any comb canning or any kind of canning that you do, you want to make sure that these rims are clean, no product, nothing on there of any description so that it interferes with the sealing process. Mm -hmm. Now the sealing process 
comes from this rubberized around here. Okay. Okay, so what we want to do is to make sure that this seal is all intact on top of the jar. And this kind of curls down a little bit so that you get a good tight seal. So we put this on here and then we put, a, uh, put the band on. Not too tight, right? Not too tight. Okay. You just do it kind of where you can feel some resistance. Okay. And uh, then after that's done, it's ready to go in the water bath. Now, in case we have somebody, Chris, who, mm -hmm. and you might not know yourself what a water bath is. Okay. okay. Water bath, you just get a, a, big, a big pot and you put enough water in so that when you put your jars in, your, your product in, you make sure that it comes an inch or two over the top. Over the top. Now, the you top. want to make yeah. sure that it's over the top and not halfway up or anything else because you want to make sure you get plenty of heat to, uh, to get the uh, sealing process mm -hmm. all the way in. So then we will, we'll do that. We'll put these in the, in, the, in the canner. Here we go. This goes in the water bath. And you will notice that the water, the water will not be up very far when you first start. But once you get the jars in, it brings the water up so that it'll come over the top. Now, if you put too much water in to begin with, and you put these jars in, what's gonna happen? It's gonna come out the top. Right. It's gonna overflow for you. So, we put this in here, and what we do, Chris, we, we put, we, we let it come to a boil. Okay. Let, uh, let it come to a good boil, and then we turn it down just to simmer, and we uh, we cook it. After it starts to boil, you start your timer for uh, 25 minutes. Okay. 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 So we're ready to look at it and see if it's see when it's going to boil. We're going to turn it up, and it comes to a boil. Special delivery. <laughs> okay. So you are our big he-man today. Mm -hmm. Let's put it on this on okay, this one because this, one. this is more padding on that. Okay. Uh, Chris, thank you for doing that for me. Oh, no problem. Um, the, um, this doesn't have to come off the, uh, the stove right now, but since we need it over here for you people to look at, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got Chris to put it over here for me. So we're going to lift right. this up okay. and like this. And you will notice this is something very important that I want, uh, want you to understand. Um, is the sealing part of this. When you first take it up, you're going to have, see the, how the top is puffed up like this? Yes, ma'am. That, that is not sealed yet. And once it cools down and it creates a vacuum in there, it will, it will uh, make a seal. So here we go. That's what they look like wow. when you first take them out. Now, if you'll notice, this, this liquid is a, a little bit more clear than this one right here. It's a different variety of peach. And also, this will, this will be a little more like that once it, uh, once it sits for a while. Uh, one thing uh, that I wanted to mention also about the sealing on home canned food, it's very important that when you open a jar of something, uh, any kind of, any kind of, well, commercially canned either, if the top is popped up, or if you have any bubbles, or if you have any discoloration, uh, I'm not talking about around the air bubbles, okay. but discoloration of the total product or something like that, throw it away. Oh, do do yeah. not use it. Uh, botulism, especially oh, okay. on uh, like green beans or something that's not acidified, when you get away from the acidified foods, the botulism is, is more prevalent. And I don't want to frighten anybody hmm. about home canned foods, but that is something that you need to be aware of. And I've eaten home canned foods all my life. And if you want to say I'm 80 years old, that's fine too. <laughs> 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 and I'll I've, let you say that. <laughs> I've never I've never been I've never been sick off of it. But I would suggest that also if if you have something like that's not acidified and you have the discoloration and you have the tops popped up like that, throw the whole thing away, jar and all. 
Yeah, because we don't want anybody to get no, sick. No, we don't want anybody to get sick. And the home canned foods are perfectly safe if you follow the simple guidelines. And what you what you've seen today has been a very very simple process, and it's very safe. This has been an acidified food, and like I said on the front end, that's the reason we did not pressure these. When when you have fruit and you don't and you have the acid already, then botulism doesn't grow in that. So uh, the reason you you uh, do the pressure is to bring the temperature up enough so that it kills any of the spores or anything in that. So this is perfectly safe to do it like this. Ms. Juanita, we appreciate that demonstration. Oh, thank you much. It's my pleasure. Okay. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Joellen, so we're going to talk about pests and diseases of seasonal colors. So yes. you want to start with that? Well, there are several things we can do. Um, so you've had planted some plants this year and they didn't do well. Maybe mm -hmm. some others did. And you want to know maybe what went wrong or right. what's going on. Um, I suggest doing crop rotations, especially a lot of people tend to put the same flowers in every year. It <laughs> might, you know, do a different color of the same flower, but they'll tend to do a lot of the same flowers every year, and that's okay. where you get into trouble. So not only is it more interesting for you and your neighbors to mm -hmm. see different flowers in your bed, but uh, it's also actually better to have the crop rotation okay. for the diseases and the bugs. Okay, that makes sense. It does. Uh, one example would be uh, like vinca. Okay. A lot of people have trouble with vinca, and it, all of a sudden they'll start having one little spot will wilt, <laughs> And then it keeps, the whole plant will wilt, and then it dies. And, right. and they're, they're mystified as what happened. Um, well, they've got it in the right place. You know, it's sunny. But it might be too wet because mm -hmm. the number one disease for, for vinca seems to be phytophthora. Okay. And so you right. can't really, you know, unless you just dig up all the soil and rechange all of it, it's always going to be there. In fact, that's a disease that's just commonly everywhere. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, what you might like to do is change that out. Instead of putting vinca in every year, go then next year do something else that likes the sun, like ageratum, celosia, lantana, marigold, zinnia. Mm -hmm. All of those are not so susceptible to the phytophthora. So, okay. Yeah. Like, like the vinca is. Okay. So change them out. Another, now that's sun. Well, what about some shade? Okay. Now the number one problem with impatience, mm -hmm. and we, and it's worse in other parts of the country than it is here, um, is the impatient powdery mildew. Okay. And what will happen is, and, and I know people have experienced this, because I, I, ha I have. I have, yeah. Um, all of a sudden they get yellowy and kind of <laughs> start to wilt. And you, you, most people don't look on the back side of the leaf. Mm -hmm. And if they did, there'd be a white, powdery, fluffy uh, part of the disease spores mm -hmm. coming out there. Uh, so, but then the leaves fall off, and then you end up with a bunch of sticks. That's right. And then the <laughs> next thing you know, the sticks die. So, I, it, but that powdery mildew, that, that organism seems to stay in the ground for a while. So it's really good to not plant there for several years to, okay. to see if that will go away. And some parts of the country is not going away, but here uh, it, it seems to, to be good in some places and, bad and worse in others. So I right. would try something else. And we and, actually learned about that maybe a couple of years ago, you know, yes. here, you know, in this area specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, yeah, it's, it's been a problem. Yeah, and, and they can put other things in like Terenia. Okay. There's some gorgeous trinia and New Guinea impatiens, caladiums, ah, yeah. and there's a new impatient that's called Bounce that's out there okay, that, I've heard of that is also uh, available. Okay. And then, then, of course, another thing, problem that people have is petunias. Petunias will suddenly turn wilty and then just die, uh -huh. suddenly. <laughs> um, and that's a lot of that condition is too wet also, but 
It also could be the Botrytis or the Phytophthora again. Right. So try something different. Begonias, coleus, um, potato, sweet potato vines, okay, sun different. patients, anything that likes kind of a sunny, part sunny, partly shady area. Okay. So that, that, in other words, the host plants, so crop rotation and resistant varieties are good to add to the ground if you've had trouble with certain plants okay. during the growing season. Let, let me ask you about the Phytophthora root rot. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do with our soils, though? Do we need to build the soils up? Or yes. what do you think? Yes, well-drained. Because all well -drained. of these diseases, and that will go into... Our, uh, our cultural, another okay. thing, we have to look for cultural problems. And we gotta think of a dis disease triangle. And a lot of people go, well, disease, what is that? <laughs> yeah, what is well, it? <laughs> a disease triangle, there's three things that have to be present for a disease to take hold. And that is the host plant. Mm -hmm. The pathogen has to be present, which okay. it most always is. And then the environment. So what of that we can, can control is the host plant. And the other thing we can control is the environment. Mm -hmm. right. Now we can't, stop it from raining on our plants. <laughs> but we can get the soil so it, well, it drains well. Mm -hmm. And so that's okay. what I would suggest, amend the soil, build it up, sort of like what we did out here out front in our flower bed. Right. We, we raised it up just a little bit so that it would drain better. Okay. And that can help out with all of those disease and insect problems. Because if, if it's weakened, not only do the diseases take over, but insects take over too. Yeah, here they come, here they come right you know, forward for the most part. And of course, if you have something that dies, another thing you can do to help prevent disease and insects in the future is to take those dead plants and actually destroy them. Don't put those in the compost uh -huh. pile. Okay. Because then you're just gonna spread the disease everywhere you put your compost. That's right, you have spores all over the place. <laughs> yeah, you don't wanna do that. <laughs> That's right. You don't wanna do that. And of course, the last thing you need to do is as a last resort is chemical control. Okay. And I would suggest using the least environmentally harmful chemical that you can just to get the disease, like aphids. Aphids get on a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, easily controlled with insecticidal soaps. And caterpillars, like uh, the cannas get the caterpillar, uh, the leaf, the leaf roller. Leaf roller. That's right. And very easily controlled with BT, right. which is Bacillus thuringiensis. So uh -huh. very easily controlled with those things. And makes your plants look real pretty. But be sure whatever you use, what if you're going to use a chemical, make sure you've got the plant, the pest ID'd. That's right, it makes a difference. And because you've got to know what you're trying to control yes. and then read the label directions because you really don't want to spray, you know, any more than you need That's to. Right. And watch the time of day you do that because you don't want to, you, you're, you're, you're displaying flowers and you've got mm. pollinators on them. So you want to do that That's at point. the end of the That's day, in the evening, just before the sun sets when the, the pollinators are not out foraging. Good point. Yeah, we don't want to harm those pollinators. No. And I'm glad you mentioned that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always read and follow the label though. You yes. know, always tell folks, just don't take our word for it. Yeah. Go ahead and read the label for yourself and you'll be just fine. And you know something else too? Mm -hmm. Some water, you know, just a, you know, a jet force of water for the most part can knock off some of those aphids and some of those, uh, you know, other pests as well. That's, you know, just put it in a little spray true. bottle, just mm -hmm. you can knock off the aphids because they're soft body and you can easily knock them off. Maybe and another thing that I would like um, people to realize is that a wilting plant does not necessarily mean it needs more water. Mm. Just check the soil and see if it actually is still moist or not because okay. you, you know, a wilting plant doesn't always mean it needs more water, and a lot of these diseases are, have problems with being overwatered. Okay, overwatered. And watering on the top of the soil surface and not on the foliage is another good key to trying to right. keep the environment in a state so that the plants don't get weakened. Okay. To get diseases in insects. All right, Joe, we definitely appreciate that information. Good as always. Uh -huh. All right. Let's take a look at these cracked cherry tomatoes that we have here in the garden. As you can see, the cracks here, okay? It's one here. And it's usually because too much moisture. Uh, the outer skin is starting to crack, hence the cracks that you see here. Uh, some people actually call it cat facing or scarring. Uh, but again, it's because of moisture, which is why it's a good idea to mulch your tomato plants so you can regulate soil moisture. The thing about these tomatoes is this, they're actually still edible. So I would actually pick these off the vine and still eat them. 
Again, they're cracked, uh, just a physiological uh, disorder. Nothing to be majorly concerned about. Go ahead and pick them off the vine, eat them, they're good. All right, Joel, and here's our Q&A session. Here's our first viewer email. I am an amateur gardener. I am looking for beautiful plants for my outdoor entryway planters. Can you give some advice for the best colorful plants that can handle the sun? And this is from Constance. So she wants colorful plants that can handle the sun, and of course, in her planter. Yeah. Uh, well, she has a lot of plants to choose from Good. because there are lots of plants that like the sun. Uh, but she doesn't exactly tell us what size her mm -hmm. containers are, and that might make a difference of where, you know, what size of plants you can put in it. But one thing, a general rule for all containers is uh, they all need a focal point, so you need to pick a plant that you want to put in the center as a main focal point or towards the back, depending on how you want to plant your flowers mm -hmm. in your uh, container. Uh, but you need a focal point plant, and you can do that uh, with, you know, a banana plant, or there's a mandevilla vine, or mandevilla on a steak, or a hibiscus on a, oh, on a you know, though all of those are good uh, focal point plants. Um, then you need something that will spill over the edge, mm -hmm. and some for sun are like petunias, um, alyssums. Uh, lantana and potato vines, all mm. of those will do well and they'll spill over the pot. Okay. Then you need something to fill in. You need the fillers. You need the fillers. Okay. You know, like, like the vincas, the marigolds, the zinnias, ageratum. Okay. All of those are good sun loving filler type plants. Okay. So those will work. Um, I would suggest also that you kind of vary the size of the flowers and or the foliage That's of the flowers point. because that will make it more interesting. You know, you need your coarse and your medium and your fine textured plants and kind of a little mix of those. Uh, and you can pick any kind of color combination okay. you want because uh, a lot of those color uh, plants come in different colors. Um, and don't forget to add your soil moist crystals. Mm -hmm because that will really improve the water uptake right. <laughs> ability of the, the plants in the container. And a little bit of thin mulch on top after you finish okay. planting, with, after you fertilize it, would be just perfect. Okay, and what would she fertilize with? Uh, I would use a slow release okay, fertilizer, slow release. and there's lots of different brands on the sure. market, but something that's slow release that'll feed it for a, a few months. Okay, all right, Constance, there you have it. Good luck, okay? Here's our next viewer email, I like this one. I have moles. I saw where you can set traps, but I would have to empty the traps and dispose of them. Yes. Yuck. Yeah. yeah. Nasty. How do you rid your yard of moles without traps? My yard looks horrible. And this is Miss Mona. Yuck, she yeah. says. Well, she needs a, a dog or a cat <laughs> that likes thinking. to eat yeah. <laughs> moles then and, and, you know, not mind the oh, digging of man. the tunnels in the yard. Um, but really traps are the only thing that's been proven effective right. with moles. Right. It, you know, it, it is our top recommendation, yes. you know, for UT Extension is using the mold traps and we know that they work. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Uh, some of those other methods out there, I'm not so sure. I think you told me yeah, once I, about I, something you've done. Yeah, I, of course I have a, a large area and I just didn't want them in certain areas. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would try the, you know, the sprays that you put on the end of your garden hose. Okay. They are, are smelly deterrents, and it's just supposed to stink for them. Okay. And, and let them go away. And it does work. The problem is, it only, not only stinks for them, but for a while it stinks for you, too. <laughs> so, I, I mean, and it didn't, it didn't last for very long. Right. But it did work for a small amount of time. So you think it ran the moles off? It, I don't think? know. Mm -hmm. I, I think they, they just went to another area. And, and since it didn't smell, they didn't come back to the area that smelled, so, because they were already in other places. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> still, it didn't last very long. And it was stinky for us, too. Right. So it wasn't pleasant. I think I may take my chance with the trap. I would think <laughs> the, the trap is a much better yeah, way to the, go. The traps work. Maybe you can have somebody else to, you know, dispose of the mold for you. There you possibly go. Miss Mona. <laughs> so I hope that helps you out, okay? All right, Joella, appreciate that. We're out of time. No okay. Thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter 
The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. If you have a gardening question, go to familyplotgarden.com. We have answers to hundreds of questions there. If your question isn't listed, you can submit one to us. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.